Well, last week we talked about disappointment and the danger of disappointment. And um, this week um, we're going to be continuing that talk a little bit kind of coming full circle and rounding back around. But last week we talked about the danger of disappointment. We looked at the the story of Peter um, as he was um, faced with disappointment as, as Jesus told him, he said, hey, you're gonna deny me three times. He said, hey, I'll never, I'll never deny you. And then Jesus was arrested and taken to the cross. And we talked about the decline of Peter's faith as he um, faced disappointment. And what we saw is that disappointment will lead to distance and then distance will lead to denial. And that's the danger of disappointment. See, we all, we all face disappointment, do we not? We all face it. It's a part of life. It's inevitable. We all get let down. People let us down. Circumstances let us down. We let ourselves down. And and even sometimes it seems like God lets us down. See, the, the point is not, hey, how can we avoid disappointment? The point is, hey, how do we process that disappointment? You know, we, we didn't talk about, hey, here's, here's four ways you can avoid disappointment in your life, because that's impossible. That's not going to happen, okay? The, the point is what you do with it when it does happen, how you process it, because how you process disappointment, and this is what we talked about last week, will determine whether it will be fear that paralyzes you or whether it'll be faith that fuels you, amen? And so how we process disappointment is what's, important because we're all going to face it. And there's a lot that we can learn from Peter and the example we looked at last week about the danger of disappointment. But here's the good news. Thank God his story did not end there. And your story doesn't have to end there either. Those of you that are maybe in the middle of disappointment now or whether you faced disappointment 20 years ago and you just haven't got over it and, and you're still struggling with it, you're still stuck there. Thank God that Jesus offered Peter a do-over. And so that's what we're gonna look at today. I wanna talk to you about moving past your disappointment. Last week, we looked at the danger of disappointment. And this week, we're gonna look at moving past your disappointment. See, what's in the past is in the past. We can't change the past, right? We can't go back in time. There's not a such thing as a time machine. We can't go back and change the past. But what we can do is learn from the past to help us change our future. Billy Graham, uh, the well-known evangelist, he said this. He said, you can't change the past, but with God's help, you can change your future. And so how do we move past our disappointment? And this message is for all of us because we all face disappointment. This isn't just for those that are in the middle of disappointment right now. You know, this is for those that, you know, maybe experienced disappointment, like I said, years ago, and you just haven't got over it. Or, you know, maybe someone let you down, maybe a family member, maybe a spouse, you know, or maybe you just are confused why God let something happen in your life. This is for all of us. This is for all of us, but with God's help, I hope that we can look at this story in scripture today as we continue to look at Peter and how he faced disappointment and see how we can take his story and learn how to move past our disappointment. Today, we're gonna be in John 21. So if you have your Bible or if you have the Bible app, you guys go ahead and turn there, John 21. And we're gonna look at the end of this story of Peter, we looked at the beginning last week. And, and just to give you a little bit of context while you're getting there, and we're gonna have the scripture up on the screens. Jesus has been arrested. He's been crucified. He's gone to the cross. Uh, he suffered and he's died there. He's been buried and he rose again three days later. And he's already uh, appeared to his disciples a few times. And before he goes, he's on his path to ascending into heaven and leaving But before he goes, he's got some unfinished business to take care of, and that's what we want to look at today. So John 21, let's look at this together. We're going to read verses 1 through 14. It says this, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. Y'all just put a a pin in right there in that word, again, because we're going to circle back to it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And it happened this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana, 
in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? And they answered, no. So Jesus shows up on the seashore and he, they, don't, they don't recognize that it's him, but they just hear this voice in the distance calling, hey guys, y'all, y'all catch anything? And no is the answer. Sometimes the best way to invite God into your situation is with an honest no. See, sometimes we like to sugarcoat it, acting like God doesn't really know what we're feeling and the emotions that we're processing. We try to put on a good face and we come to church and we try to smile and we try to tell everybody that everything's going good, everything's all right. And sometimes the best thing we can do is just be honest with God and say, no. Hey, did you, did you enjoy the worship time this morning? No. Hey, did you get anything out of that message? No. Did you have a good week? No. Sometimes it's just good to be honest about how you're feeling. God already knows your heart. He knows what you're going through. He knows all of that. So just be honest with him. Tell him, no, you know, life sucks right now. And that might be a a weird word to say from the platform, but sometimes life sucks. And we can amen that. Amen. And so... When God calls out from the shore and he says, hey, how's it going? Is it going all right? No. Life isn't going well. Maybe the first step that some of you need to take today in moving past your disappointment is just be honest with God. Just be honest with God about your disappointment. Let's keep reading. And Jesus said, he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John. That's how he liked to refer to himself in his gospel. It's really really interesting how he does that. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter... As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped in the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, only about 100 yards. I think this is really funny because as soon as they realize it's Jesus, Peter hits the water. (laughs) Who can relate to that fact when when life is so bad and you just can't wait to get to Jesus? You just can't wait to get to church. Sunday can't come fast enough because you just want to get to Jesus. And I think it's kind of funny too how Peter jumps in the water and John makes this little footnote because it really has no purpose other than the fact I think he was pointing at the fact that, hey, Peter, you just left us here with this boat that's being weighed down by all these fish and you jumped in the water because you couldn't wait 100 yards to get to Jesus and now we're having to tow in all this to the shore. It's funny, I think Simon and Simon Peter and John sort of have this competition going. Um, if you read, um, when, when Jesus uh, was risen and Mary brought the news back, they both ran to the tomb and John beat Peter there. And, and even in this story, John was the first one to realize that it was Jesus. And I bet Peter was like, I'm not gonna let him be first this time. I'm gonna beat him there. So I'm just jumping in the water and I'm going. Because sometimes when life has just got you down, you just gotta get to Jesus. You just gotta get there. And that's why when, when life hits hard, people are like, I just gotta get to church. I just gotta talk to a pastor. You know, I just gotta talk to somebody because I just need Jesus to help. And so that's where Peter is. He's down in his disappointment and he realizes Jesus is on the shore and whatever I gotta do, I'm gonna get there. And when the rest of the disciples got the boat there, it says this in verse nine, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore by himself, dragged the net full of fish by himself back to the shore. There was 153 fish there. 
But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. It did the same with the fish. This was now the third time. There's another word, just put a pin in it. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So here are the disciples. Here's Peter. Not all the disciples, just some of them. They've just faced one of the most stressful periods of time they will, they've ever faced or they ever will face. Okay? And so they have followed Jesus for three years. They've been faithful followers. They've been faithful friends. They've been faithful disciples. And Jesus is arrested. He's taken to the cross. He's crucified. And Life is just turned upside down. Life as they knew it for the last three years was turned upside down. What they thought was gonna happen didn't happen. They were faced with disappointment. And the, Jesus going to the cross made them question everything. Made them question everything. What, what are we gonna do now? Even after Jesus had risen, because we're, we're after the resurrection, even after he's risen and he's appeared to them a couple times, they're asking themselves, what, what are we gonna do now? How are we gonna feed our families? What, what do we do next? They're questioning everything. And when life doesn't play out, we just start to question everything. Well, what, what am I gonna do? You know, I, I thought I was gonna get that job, but what, what, what am I gonna do now? And so they're questioning everything and they decide, hey, let's just go fishing. Let's go back to that thing that we used to do and we did it so well. And so in, in John 21, verse three, Peter tells the rest of the disciples, I'm going out to fish. And then he tells them, okay. Or they tell him, they say, hey, we'll go with you. So having faced the disappointment of the cross and not knowing what else to do, Peter and the other disciples have now returned to the one thing that they knew best. They're trying to move past their disappointment. They're trying to move forward. They're trying to, to get over this disappointment. They're trying however they can to, to move past it, but even that's letting them down. Because you see, they, they, they went out fishing. They spent all night fishing. They, they put the nets in the water and they didn't catch anything. And even that's letting them down. So we've got, not only are we disappointed, but now we got more disappointment to go on top of the dis disappointment we already had. It's just, it's not working. And they just can't seem to catch a break. See, there's nothing wrong with fishing. There's nothing wrong with what they were doing, but I think more importantly, more important than what they were doing, it's when they were doing it. Because God had called them to something greater. If you think back, this story's happened before. If you know your Bible, you know this has happened before. When Jesus initially called Peter and the rest of these disciples, <laughs> they were doing the very thing that they're doing in this story. And just to give you a little bit of recap there, you'll find the rest of the story in Luke chapter five. But Jesus is preaching to the, the multitudes. He's got a large crowd there and he's preaching. And, and it says the disciples, they're there in their boats. They had just got done fishing for the whole night and they're cleaning their nets. They, they didn't catch anything that night. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, hey, can I use your boat for a second? And Peter lets him in and he gets in the boat. And then he tells Peter, hey, just push out a little bit from the shore. He was trying to get away from the crowd because they were pushing so much into him. And he turns to Peter and says, hey, can I use your boat? And there's a message all in that in and of itself, you know, Jesus gets in your boat sometimes and he calls you even in the most unexpected of ways. Um, but he gets in Peter's boat and he says, hey, we just push out a little bit. And then they just push out a little bit further. And, and before you know it, they're out in the water and Jesus says, hey, why don't you let down your nets for a catch? And, you know, the disciples try to tell him, hey man, you know, we've just done this all night. There's no fish out here. They're not, they're not biting. It's not, it's not going to work. But if you tell us to, we'll do it. And they drop their nets into the water and they got such a large catch of fish, um, just like in this story. And, and then Peter turns to, or Jesus turns to Peter in that story. And, and we'll put this scripture up on the screen, Luke chapter five and verse 11. And this is what Jesus said to Simon after this happened. He said, don't be afraid from now on, from now on. On. So moving forward from here, moving forward from this point on, you're going to fish for people. 
No longer are you going to fish for fish. No longer are you going to be a, a, a fisherman like this, but I've called you to something greater. I've given you a, a bigger purpose in life. I've given you a greater calling. So you're no longer going to fish for fish. You're going to fish for people. And this wasn't who Peter was anymore. So Jesus has died on the cross, he's risen, um, and Peter doesn't know how to move forward, so he just returns to the very thing that he knew, but that's not who he was anymore. That's not who God had called him to be. Peter and his disciples, they were just lost. They were lost in their disappointment, but there's good news because Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up. Even though Peter and the other disciples, they had walked away, even though Peter had denied Jesus, even though they just seemed lost and they didn't know what to do next, good news, Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up. It says this in, in verse four of our text. It says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Notice what time Jesus showed up. Early. I know some people don't like that. <laughs> How many early risers do we have in the room? There's, I know Richie is. He gets up at like 3 a.m. I don't understand it. Um, but he gets up at 3 a.m. And, uh, and so I'm not an early riser. I, I do, you know, try to get up in time enough to get to work on time and, and, and get my work done. Um, but some of us don't like that word early. But sometimes God can do his greatest work early in the morning. And I'm not talking about, you know, just the quiet time before work. I'm talking about those wee morning hours when you can't sleep because life is just weighing you down and you wake up for some reason at 3.36 in the morning and you roll over and you're so depressed because that clock is, you should not be awake at that time. And you see what time it is and you just can't go to sleep and God can do his greatest work in those moments because sometimes God has you awake for a reason. And he has something he wants to say. And this happened to me one time. I was in a tough season where I just didn't understand why things were happening or really, in this case, why things weren't happening. And I just couldn't sleep and I was awake early in the morning and I just felt God tell me, he says, I, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. I didn't really know I didn't know what God wanted to say, but I felt in my heart I needed to just sit down and I needed to read. And so I got my Bible, you know, and I went into the living room. I turned on the, the lamp and I just sat there and I, I felt in my spirit, something told me, read the Psalms. And so I sat down and I just started reading the Psalms. And I just told myself, I'm gonna read until God tells me something. And so I read Psalm one and Psalm two and, Psalm 3, I just kept reading. And I got to Psalm 27, and I shared this scripture last week um, during the service. I got to Psalm 27, and I got to the end of the, the chapter. And it says, I will remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, take heart, be strong, and wait for the Lord. And when I read that, I just closed my Bible because I had the word that I needed. Because I was in this season of, God, I don't understand why this is playing out this way. I don't understand why this is going wrong. And I don't understand why you're not opening this door and opening this door. And I don't understand why I'm still in this season and why this just won't end. And he had a word he needed to tell me. And it came at, I don't even know what time it was, but it was early in the morning. I hadn't slept. And I just felt like I needed some time with the Lord. And so I got up and I, and I read until I got a word from the Lord. And you know what I did after that? went back to sleep because sometimes God just wants to talk to you and he can use that early morning when it's quiet, when it's peaceful, when there's no distractions, when there's nobody around you and it's just you and him and you can hear him speak. And so Jesus showed up on the shore 
early in the morning. And it was, it was so early probably that it was so dark outside. It was still, it was still dark. And there are some of you today that life just seems void of any sort of light and hope. It just seems empty. And God has something he wants to say to you today. Maybe he's been trying to get your attention. Maybe he's been on the shore and he's been yelling and you just haven't answered back. You haven't been honest with him. You haven't responded, but he's trying to get your attention and Jesus is calling out and you might not even know it's him. The disciples didn't even know that that was Jesus on the shore, but they still answered. They still responded. And maybe you're here today in the service or maybe you're joining online or maybe you're watching this months from now and just for some reason you landed on this video and Jesus is trying to get your attention and tell you something. He's trying to communicate with you. And if that's the case, he has you here for a reason. There's no accidents in the room. There's no, you know, happenstance in the room. There's no coincidence. No, God uses his Holy Spirit to get you where you need to be to hear from him when he wants to talk to you. And so if that's you today and you feel the Holy Spirit moving, you feel him speaking, that's Jesus calling out for you. And sometimes you can't even know it's him. You don't even know it's him because, you know, the disciples didn't even know it was him. And it doesn't take sight. Your sight doesn't affect your hearing. You know, you can still hear from God even though you can't see what's going on around you. Even if it's confusing, God can still speak. And sometimes when you can't see and you aren't distracted, his voice is even louder. And you can hear him even better. Psalm 119 says this, it says in, in verse 105, it says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. And we all know that verse. We've, we've, we've heard that verse before. We've maybe even had that verse memorized. And I was just reading and preparing for this and I flipped over to the message translation and I read this same verse and this is what it says. It says, by your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. I've committed myself and I will never turn back from living by your righteous order. Everything's falling apart on me. God, put me together again with your word. Have you ever felt like everything's fallen apart? Have you ever felt like just the whole, whole thing's coming undone? The wheels are coming off the bus. We could come up with all kinds of cliche statements to use there, but sometimes it just seems like everything's just falling apart. And I love how, you know, this, this paraphrased version just puts different words to that. It actually, we can relate to that, right? That everything's falling apart, God, everything's not going as planned, but God put me together again with your word, with your word. And so when it seems like life's falling apart, when it seems like nothing's going as planned, when you're in the middle of disappointment, press into his word, press into what he's trying to say. And some of you, you're, you're tired this morning. Maybe you're yawning and it's hard for you to stay awake because you were up all night, just like I was telling you about in my story, because it just seems like everything's falling apart. It just seems like nothing's going as planned. And in order to move past your disappointment, you have to listen for God's voice, even though you can't see him. Even though it seems like he's so far from your situation that he's not present in what you're going through, he's there and he's speaking. But see, what we do so many times is we just prefer the noise over God's voice. When things just aren't going right, we just try to numb it with whatever we can. We try to numb it with Netflix or we try to numb it with a relationship. But God can't speak if you don't give him space to speak. If every waking moment of your life is spent on social media, then what space is there for God to speak? And I'm not just picking on social media. I know I talk about that a lot and I know it has some good and I know it has a place and I know it's, it's good to keep relationships in, 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 in touch. Um, but I do believe that it 
is something that we numb and we go to and we, we spend and waste a lot of time just thumb swiping when we could spend a lot of time giving God space to speak. And I, again, I'm not just picking on that one avenue. That, we could say the same thing about a relationship or we could say the same thing about a pill or we could say the same thing about your work. We, we'll, we'll use any, anything we can to numb the pain that we're feeling. And, and might I just say that, that the devil will use it. The, the list is long of the devices that the devil will use to keep you distracted from hearing from God. But thank God that in this story, the disciples heard Jesus speaking and they responded. And they were honest with them. They were honest about their situation. They were honest about how disappointed they were. But they still listened and they answered him. And after they listen and they obey and they do what he tells them to do, they follow his suggestions. They bring in a miraculous catch of fish and Peter jumps in the water and he comes up on the shore and they have breakfast with Jesus. They have breakfast there with Jesus. And then this happens. And this is the heart of what I want us to see today. In verse 15, the story continues and that they come up on shore and Jesus has this meal prepared. And I think it's really interesting that whether or not they actually listened to him and, and put the net on the other side of the boat to catch the fish. Jesus already had fish prepared for them when they got to the shore. He was ready whether they listened or not. And I think that's a whole, that could be a whole nother message in and of itself. But they come up on shore and they have breakfast with him. And it says this in verse 15. We'll put the words on the screen. It says this. It says, when they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, I know this is a popular passage of scripture and there's been many messages preached on this and there are differing opinions on really the entire meaning of this text, a lot of people focus in on the, uh, of the different words that are used, because if you study the Greek of this passage, the, this exchange between Peter and John, there are different Greek words used for love um, at, at different times. And, and the, the word phileo is, is used, which is a brotherly kind of love, which is where we get the, the, the name of our city, um, Philadelphia. And then there's agape love, which is a God kind of love, a sacrificial kind of love, the love that God loves us with. Um, and they, they use these two words interchangeably. And if you really study the book of John as a whole, like this, this, this sort of interchange of these words happens quite often. And so I, I think there is some, possibly some meaning in these different words that are used, but I think more important than the words that are used here is the number. It, the, the, the importance isn't in the words, but in the numbers. See, it's only been a few weeks since Peter has denied Jesus. And, and when Peter denied Jesus, he did it three times. And so here Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? Yes. Do you love me, Peter? Yeah. Peter, do you love me? And it says that Peter was hurt. And I think he's hurt because on that third time, he realized what Jesus was doing. Because he remembered what he had done when he denied Jesus those three times. See, Jesus was giving Peter, he, he was giving him grace for his mistakes. Jesus was giving Peter grace for his mistakes. He was trying to tell Peter that you don't have more doubt than I have grace. You don't have more denial than I have grace. You don't have more failure than I have forgiveness. 
That's what he was trying to tell Peter here. And he, he, he tried to say, hey, for as many times as you could deny me, if you're gonna deny me three times, I'm gonna tell you and give you the opportunity to say that you love me right back because I've got more grace for you. You see, this whole story is a full circle moment for Peter. I'm, I'm sure as they're sitting there and they're having breakfast and I just, I read scripture and I sort of imagine things and I say this all the time when I preach because I sort of elaborate on things because I imagine that they're sitting there around this fire and they're eating and I, I imagine the disciples and Jesus, they're, they're reminiscing and they're, they're, you know, laughing and they're having conversation. And I just imagine Peter just sitting over here on the side and he's eating and I just imagine he's quiet. I know I would be if I were in his position. I'm sure he's just quiet, enjoying time with Jesus, yes, but he's just quiet because he knows what he's done. He knows what has taken place over the last couple of weeks. And I'm sure as he's sitting there, I'm sure after what has just happened, he's remembering Jesus calling him that first time. He remembers that first miraculous catch of fish. I'm sure as they're sitting there, he's eating the, the bread, he's eating the fish. I'm sure he's remembering when Jesus fed the 5,000 on that hillside that one day where he took the five loaves and the two fish and he broke it and it was enough to feed everybody. I'm sure Peter's remembering that as they're sitting around that fire. I'm sure he's remembering the fire that he was around when he denied Jesus. And it's interesting because the only time that the Greek words for that fire is used is in those two stories when Jesus was denying Jesus and then here where Jesus is giving him the opportunity to say how much he loves him. It, I'm sure he's processing all this and all these thoughts are swirling around in his head. And, and this is the heart of what I want us to see today. And this is for anybody that's struggling with disappointment. This, this situation, this story, isn't as much about Jesus letting Peter down. This isn't just as much about Jesus disappointing Peter. I believe that, that that's already been dealt with. Because at this point, Peter knows that Jesus is who he said he was, and even more so. Because all along, Peter thought that Jesus was, he knew he was the Messiah, but he thought his purpose was to come and to overthrow Rome and to establish an earthly kingdom. But that's not what Jesus had in store. He had a higher purpose, he had a higher plan. And so at this point, Peter's seen Jesus. Jesus has already showed himself to him. He, he knows he's risen from the grave. He knows he is who he says he was. And so I don't believe that this story is as much dealing with Jesus letting Peter down because Peter had already seen Jesus. Remember those words that I told us to put a pen in at the beginning of John chapter 21. It says, After, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples. He's already appeared to them. And, and we see later in what we read that this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples. This was a, this was a full circle moment for Peter. See, Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus rose again on the third day, and this is the third time Jesus has appeared to his disciples. Now he's asking Peter three times. This, this, this number three is very, very important in this story. And I think it's because Jesus has a relationship he's looking to resurrect. And Jesus is not dealing with the fact that he let Peter down. No, that, that's already been dealt with. Jesus is, or Peter's already come to terms with that. No, it, it seems to me that he's, he's dealing with the fact that Peter let him down. And there are people here today and you feel stuck in your disappointment because you feel like you just keep letting God down. And if I'm honest with myself, I can relate to that. I can relate to Peter here because Peter walked with Jesus. <laughs> he saw miracle after miracle after miracle. He was friends with the savior of the world. And when it came down to it, when his moment was up, he dropped the ball. And Jesus even told him hours before that, he even, he, he told him, he gave him a, a sneak peek into the future. He said, hey, Peter, don't be so quick to declare that you'll follow me to the end because you're gonna deny me three times. Oh no, I'll never do that. 
I'll never do that. And then when it came down to it, he let him down. And so I don't think Jesus showed up on the seashore that day as much to prove to Peter that he was who he said he was. No, he was there for Peter because Peter felt like I dropped the ball. I've let him down. And I know I've felt that way in my life so many times. It's like, God, I just keep, I can't get over this. I keep struggling with this. I keep going back to this. I keep letting you down. And, and sometimes when that happens, we just sort of shut ourselves off and, and we, we, we shut ourselves down and, and we put distance between us and Jesus because we feel like we just keep letting him down and we keep letting him down and we keep disappointing God. And, 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 and there's so many people that are just stuck in that. You're trapped in disappointment, not, not that God has disappointed you, but you feel like you keep disappointing Him. You feel like you keep letting Him down. And God's saying today, I didn't know you were holding me up. You don't hold me up, I'm God. And, and I think it's important if we, if we look in John chapter 20, I think we see something very, very important. And we're gonna put this up on the screen. This is, these are the verses right before the verses we read today. And it says this in John 20, verses 30 through 31. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And this is, these are the last verses of chapter 20. And what it seems to me is that John is, he's, he's wrapping it up. <laughs> he's wrapping up his book. It almost seems like, hey, we could have stopped here. This could have been the end of the story. What a great way to end the book. What a great way to end this gospel story of Jesus and all that he did for us. He did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't recorded. You know, he did so much. But then John says, hey, there's one more thing that I need you to know about. See, I think God knew that when he had John include this chapter in his gospel that we were gonna feel like we've let God down. We were gonna feel like we've dropped the ball. And the good news is just like Jesus showed Peter that, hey, I've got more grace for you than you've got failure is there's grace today. There's grace for you, whether you've denied Jesus or whether you're, you feel like you've disappointed God and there's no hope for you. There's, there's no chance that he could ever forgive you or want you back or restore you. He's got a purpose for your life. And so I don't know if that's you today but I believe that God included this chapter in this, in his word for those times where we feel like there's no, there's no hope for us. Because there is nothing that we could do to earn God's grace. He gives that freely to us. And there's forgiveness for you today. And maybe, maybe you're in the lowest time of your life and Maybe it feels like God's let you down. Maybe you're just confused why things are happening or not happening. It just seems like couldn't get any lower. I know in this case, doesn't get much lower than Jesus going to the cross and dying and the confusion that Peter and the disciples must have felt. But see, God will use the lowest of lows to show his greatest love to you and me. And so if that's you today, if you feel like, man, life has just got me down. He wants to show you love today. He wants to show you grace. He wants to show you forgiveness. He wants to show you hope today. Let's close all our eyes and bow our heads this morning.
If that's you today, I just wanna pray for you. If you're struggling with disappointment, whether disappointment towards God or whether disappointment in yourself, there's a way to move past it. And that way is through the cross. That way is through the cross. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't, I don't know Jesus. I don't have a relationship with him. I don't, I don't know what that's like. I don't, I don't know what that is. You can come to know who he is today. You can come to know who he is today. We have people ready to talk to you about that after the service. We have a prayer team right down here. I'll be available. Pastor Richie is available. We have people available to pray with you and, and help you navigate and come into a grow, growing relationship with Jesus. And so let me just pray for all of us today. And then we're just gonna sing. God, we thank you that you speak, that you show up when we need you the most. And God, I believe that you're speaking to people this morning, that you are moving, that you're calling people out even when they don't even know it's you that's speaking. God, you brought us all here, whether we're in person or whether we're online, you have us all here for a reason and there's something you wanna say to us. And so God, in this moment, would we respond? In this moment, would we answer back? God, I pray that every one of us, we can leave this place not defeated by our disappointment, but I pray that you will uplift our spirits. Know that you have enough grace for us, that for all the times that we doubt your faithfulness, you've got more grace to pour out on us. All the times we feel like we failed and dropped the ball, you've got more forgiveness, you've got more mercy for us. So God, would you help us as we leave this place to live for you, to live in the freedom that you bought for us on the cross. We love you today. We love you. You guys stand. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.